Hi, everybody. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yep. Uh, for those on this side, are you? Can you see? Okay. You're good. You don't want to move this way. Such nice seats. No. Here. There are. <laughs> um, so this is a beautiful thing for me. I hope everybody here enjoys themselves and gets something out of this. My name is Mike, and I am the founder of Starts With Me, and we are a consultancy specializing in workplace mental health and K-12 education. And our primary purpose, one, to reduce suffering, so that's a big one, but uh, other than that, to help people determine the difference or the balance between compassion and accountability. So whether that's in your home, in a relationship, at school, at work, etc., from there, I think problems are much easier to solve when we can cut a line between whose responsibility is what, and then support people from there. So we have a bunch of questions we're gonna go through. It's gonna be more of a conversation. I think we've discussed enough about where it's gonna go and how it's gonna get there, and we haven't come up with anything, so we'll just go, go as it goes. Um, I think that's about it. So I'm gonna let each person introduce themselves, starting to my right with Celise, and then we'll start talking. Okay, hello, everybody. Uh, so Celise Fletcher, I have a- Gotta uh, make sure you hold it right in front of here. Right in front of yeah, the microphone. Um, so, <laughs> or we don't need them. That's the other thing. But I think for the yeah. recording, okay. Yeah, I have my consulting practice called Fletcher Consultancy for 15 years, and prior to that, I was an executive at Can West. Um, so I've done the whole thing from employee up to executive, and then to consultant. And my practice focuses on uh, work restoration. So I will do everything from investigations um, on harassment complaints. Uh, developing healthy workplaces, um, anything that gets us there. Um, it's quite complex, and I love the work that I do, and I get to meet wonderful people like this and sit in front of you and hopefully answer your questions. Can we clap? Can we clap? <laughs> okay, I'm Carrie Topping. I'm the HR leader here at Amazon uh, for Toronto. Um, I met Mike about a year ago when I uh, reached out to a bunch of our leaders here in Toronto and said, you know, next Bell Let's, I need to do something more than slap up the uh, Bell Let's Talk Day um, Facebook profile picture. Um, and so a year later, there's uh, some folks in the crowd that helped me get there. And um, I met Mike sort of maybe just after that. And it's taken a year to find some of our favorite professionals and get them on the panel. <laughs> so here they are. My name is Barry Simon. I'm a psychiatrist, a psychoanalyst, and I, I do some executive coaching, so I don't know why I'm here, but <laughs> I'm going to answer some of your questions. And, um, and I work a lot with people with um, chronic illnesses and help them with the things that get in the way of their succeeding with taking care of themselves. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> It's very informal around here, so let's keep that up. So um, when I'm nervous, I get a little giddy and a little silly. So if I'm silly, you know I'm nervous. So I'm Heidi, Heidi Walk. I'm a physician and um, what's called an MD psychotherapist. And I have been running mindfulness-based stress reduction programs for about 17 years. And I've had about 3,500 people plus go through my programs. And, um, and I also run other programs. I run another program called Mindful Self-Compassion, and I run a program called Conscious Living Program, a Conscious Living Group. So um, I'm interested in conscious living, um, and part of conscious living is taking responsibility for ourselves. And um, I, I was sharing with somebody before, I used to do family medicine, and um, when I did family medicine, even though I loved it, I really enjoyed it a lot. I felt like I was giving people fish. And when I started doing the mindfulness-based stress reduction programs, the acronym for that is MBSR. So just so you know, if I start saying MBSR, I, I felt like I was teaching people how to fish. 
right? So I was empowering people in their lives to live more full, empowered, conscious lives and deal with their stressors and their illnesses in that way. So in my groups, one of the reasons I think maybe Mike asked me to come is because in my groups I have a lot of people who are on stress leave from work and in the groups and so that's part of what I do. So I think that's why I was invited to come. <laughs> that's one reason, yeah. Okay. And uh, you, this is an invitation, but Heidi's going to lead us in a one minute meditation yeah. or centering, whatever you want to call it. Um, you do not have to participate if you don't want to. It's always an invitation and, and I'll pass it to Heidi. So again, it's, everything's, it's all optional, right? So if you choose to just allowing yourself to um, bring your attention towards this time just your breathing, your breath, if that feels comfortable for you. And um, maybe if it's okay with you as you exhale, allowing for a sense of a sigh. How would your body feel if you were allowing yourself just to sigh? And then allowing your attention to come into the next in-breath and the next out-breath. So we're just allowing ourselves to maybe observe or watch our breathing. And if it feels right for you, even to feel the rhythm of your breathing. And, you know, thoughts are going to happen. That's the nature of the mind to produce thoughts. And just when you can, oh, thinking, thinking. And come back to this sensation of this breath. And again, if that doesn't feel comfortable for you, you can always just notice the parts of your body that are connected to the chair or the floor. And then if your eyes are closed, you can open your clothes and we'll go back to Mike. Thanks. Okay, so we're just going to start asking questions and talking. Um, I've been asked a bunch why, or where did these questions come from? And so I think maybe it's important to point that out. Partly from a lot of my experience having these conversations in workplaces or schools or in my own psychotherapy and, and in my own way of helping other people. These are the questions that always rest at the bottom of my mind. And I hear other people ask them all the time as well. So here we go. So question number one, how to balance compassion and accountability when working with someone who's struggling? So this could, again, be personal, in the workplace, in a family, etc. And so the idea is that our psychotherapists, psych what was the word, psychoanalyst, psychiatrist, doctors, will give us the human you know, psychological perspective, and then Carrie and Solis will give us the how these things manifest in a workplace and how they get managed and sorted out. Okay, so can we start over with you two? Do you want me to re re repeat that question? No, I think I have it in my pouch. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Just remember, try your best to speak into the mic. Yeah. Uh, well, I think it's really valuable to um, look at, you know, what are the um, um, criteria for good um, psychotherapeutic outcome? And uh, when we're dealing in, in the terms of psychotherapy and a lot of it has to do with the therapist and patient or client uh, relationship. So it's uh, about developing a safe container uh, for whoever you're working with. And, um, and so there's actually factors that people have found which, um, you know, so the therapist's ability for empathy, um, to be able to get inside the uh, clients or patients uh, uh, under, understanding the way they're thinking or how they're thinking and the way they're feeling, um, a genuineness of the therapist, 
um, a sense of um, honesty within the relationship to some degree. Um, and there's other factors involved, which I could go on and list if you want. Um, and part of what that is, I mean, compassion, it, first of all, let's, let me define compassion, okay? Um, compassion is a recognition of the suffering that exists within another or within oneself, if it's self-compassion within yourself, okay? And um, so it's not only the recognition, it's not an intellectual thing, it's an emotional thing. So you feel the other person suffering. Empathy is the ability to feel what another person is feeling. And, um, and as well, in compassion, there's a desire, desire to alleviate that suffering. Okay? So the desire to alleviate that suffering. And, um, and so that's part of what compassion is. So there's an intention towards recognizing and acknowledging or validating what another person has experienced. And, um, you know, if I were to ask a show of hand here, who here doesn't like to be validated? <laughs> exactly. So every human being has a desire to be validated. It's a need, right? And so um, there's a piece in that of, of what's my intention, you know, when I'm, when I'm with someone. That's my genuine intention. So I think that's one piece so that we have to remember when we're dealing with someone. And, and again, um, I, was looking up, I was looking up the definition of accountability. And um, I think for me, um, it, it has to do more not so much with accountability, and I think that's probably perhaps more within the, you know, talking about the workplace situation, but it has to do with um, um, responsibility, and our, which means not, it's not responsibility, I mean, it's our ability to respond. Does that make sense? To situations. And, and our ability to um, um, recognize that we have impact, and to look at what our impact might be in the world, and as a patient or as, as a, um, um, you know, as a client. And um, that's hard for many people. So, I mean, many people don't think they have any impact in the world, or impact at all, is that fair to say, right? And so part of what that is, is in, I think, in that piece of compassion or in that piece of empathy and letting that person know that they matter to, to me, that helps them recognize that they do have impact, they matter. And that helps with the sense of responsibility. So that's one lens through which I can, I can talk about this. And there's many, many other lenses. We could be here for five hours, but I'll let Barry talk a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, that was good, yeah. <laughs> things I wanted to say, too. So, so I, I don't love the word accountability. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what it means. But responsibility, I, I think, is, a, is the word I would use as well. And when I'm working with someone suffering or struggling, which is most of the day, actually, I'm, I'm, I actually think it's a moment-to-moment -moment decision. So I'm watching someone, and if I see that they're becoming stressed or tense, by what they're talking about, I'm going to lean towards compassion. I'm going to lead towards validation. Because the more that there is a point when people get stressed and they immediately shut down. Uh, and they just are no longer listening to a word I'm saying, even if they hear those words. And my job at that moment is really, and I think of this both as from a neuroscience perspective and from a compassion therapy perspective. I gotta quiet their nervous system down. My, my only job when they look have that look of fight flight is to quiet them down, because my ultimate goal is for change and for growth and transformation. But if I have them in that place of stress and tense, everybody in this room knows it. Once you're in stress and tense, you're actually not learning much. You're actually in a place of no longer learning. So I quiet them. I'm, I'm empathic. I'm validating. And in the back of my mind, I have to tell you, I'm thinking, okay, where's our move? So I, even though I'm doing that, I'm doing it 30 years, so I can do that at the same time as planning. And then I think, okay, so how do I get them back into like wondering what's going on? Like how come they're in this mess, whatever the mess might be? Why are they so depressed? And, and what's happening in their life? And that's where I'm gonna then, you know, after a, a, a few moments, wanna see if they can hear something from me that's going to lead to responsibility, which means, how's it coming from you? Because it really doesn't matter what's coming from anybody else. Anything else anybody's doing in your life, 
in my office at least, here you have more power maybe. I got no power. The only power I have is the person I'm sitting across from. And I can help them empower themselves by having them realize the role they're playing. So I'm always dancing between, I call it like kind of compassion and coaching. Compassion and coaching. And then I try to sneak in and you know this might be about your mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of my day. And I mean that both with seriousness and not. At some point I'm going to want to go underneath to what it's really coming from, which has to do with probably about... You know, growing up and the stresses they've been through, and even if they just, if they're on work stress, I can tell you it doesn't take long before I'm talking about, tell me more about growing up, and did you notice your boss sort of looks like your dad? <laughs> yes. I said, like, yes, how, you've met my boss. Yeah, yeah I met your boss. Uh, about an hour ago, the last person. Uh, that's, that's kind of it. You're playing that game back and forth. Okay, so I, hope <laughs> I, I don't really don't know where to go from there. But, um, so I'm obviously taking this in a first lease is too, from a perspective of being at work. And uh, it's, it's so very different from where you're coming from, but I can see how it all links. Um, for the leaders that I work with, I usually find that the compassion piece is the easy part. Most of our leaders innately are super compassionate about, about somebody struggling. Where they get scared is when they have to start holding them accountable. And I feel like that's where we come in and we kind of um, we kind of help them make that transition. So we can be compassionate, we can be gentle, but what are you gonna do to get us back, get you back to the person that we know you can be to be able to deliver on your job? Um, that's partly why I really connected with Mike because I really, really feel like it starts with the individual. So as employers, we spend all this time saying, what, what do you need to be able to, to bring your best self to work? Part of that conversation then becomes what are you as an individual going to do to keep yourself well? That's where I was going. What can you <laughs> Where do I begin? Um, there's lots of different stages, and Heidi was mentioning this before, that hopefully we're able to catch it as it's just sort of developing and not when it gets to a crisis stage. And I've been at both uh, ends more lately. It's on the crisis side. So there's accountability on the part of the individual. There's accountability on the part of the employer. And sometimes, even with a compassionate employer not knowing what to do, sometimes there's accommodation, and then it questions the compassion. So the first thing that I always say is the most important thing that we all do is we be kind. So we have to first be kind to ourselves, and then when we're kind to ourselves, we can be kind to others. So much like with uh, Barry, even if I'm doing a really complicated uh, investigation and it's pretty awful stuff, I'm always kind to that person who's been accused because in there somewhere is a soul who has a heart, who's got feeling and wants to find a way out. And I cannot contribute to anxiety or cause that because two, once morally it's wrong. And the second part is that I could contribute to a poisoned workplace. So it's something that's really important that we remember is always to be kind. And it's not easy to be kind because it's not easy to be kind to yourself. The second part is that um, we're compelled by law, as we know in terms of our uh, workplaces. Now that uh, mental health is insurable under the uh, workers' comp, it's our responsibility to ensure that our workplaces um, are you know, healthy and well. So there's a huge accountability, and I think we'll get into that later on, um, and maybe even some questions from the audience about what we can do as employers for that. Great. Um, too many things are going through my head. One of which is seeing this, so all of these questions and the things we're talking about at the personal level, the interpersonal level, the group, so maybe your office team or your company, depending on how big it is, and then the sort of societal and structural level. And some of our conversations in advance of this were centered around how all those things are kind of enmeshed but we can look at them in their individual contexts. So just to help that all come together. Uh, I, I should have said as well, if at any point you have a burning desire to ask a question, just put up your hand. But otherwise, you know, we'll have a, at least 30 minutes um, at the end to do questions. So, okay, question number two. What underlies people's incredible capacity to deceive themselves about their personal troubles 
And how does this impact their relationships? <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. That's down there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe if I could just start. If I could Please. Start because, um, this is a huge question I have of the experts, and that is, I don't say that word. Um, increasingly, um, in doing investigations on harassment and bullying, the respondent is in absolute denial about even the actions that they've taken. And when there are witnesses and the evidence is put before them, they are still, they continue afterward, they will even follow up perhaps with human rights or with the labor board. And it's a real conundrum of how to help that person recognize it, um, and even the impact of what they're doing in the workplace. So it's a huge question I've got. <laughs> Could you yeah. Keep repeating the question. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> what under so basically what? Why do people stay in denial, and how does that impact their relationships? So I just to speak to that quickly as you guys ponder your years of study. A lot of people. Uh, who I'll speak from experience in my realm of expertise, people in addiction recovery or who are struggling with substance abuse, are, it's so hard to accept that you have a problem. And, you know, there's no magical answer to that. But it, it's like, it can be extrapolated to any part of your life. If you're at the grocery store and somebody cuts in line and you say, uh, excuse me, you just budgeted me. And they're like, no, I didn't. So that's an example of denial because they don't want to. Anyway, so it, it, there's varying degrees of denial and there's varying degrees of how that influences, you know, a relationship in a workplace. Okay, sorry. Oh, okay, well, it's a great question and there's a multitude of complexities in the answers to that. There's so many lenses through which you could see it. And again, if we had five or five, this time five days, not five hours, we could um, explore it in more detail. I always like the joke, you know, denial is not just the river in Egypt, right? So, okay, that, that's all done. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, so I think I want to approach this through the lens of, um, of our humanity and, and as human beings. And, um, you know, there's two, two states of, of being that we really, really have difficulty with. One is fear. And uh, which is an emotion as well, and the other is pain. And um, and I'm going to put into pain shame, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And so, um, you know, I don't know. Are, is it anybody here familiar with the ACE studies, um, adverse childhood events studies? No. Anyways, uh, so I won't go there. <laughs> um, but but essentially. Um, you know, when we have adverse experiences in our childhood, and all of us at different times, I mean, most of our learning in our childhood is, is, is unconscious, implicit. It becomes, implicit means it becomes automatic and unconscious. And then we forget about it, and we often use, especially if there's painful experiences, okay? And, and all of us have experienced some form of trauma or some form of adverse experience in our lifetime. And we have a mechanism called repression, which is unconscious because it doesn't feel good to feel that. And then we have another mechanisms of coping strategies, say suppression and denial. And we use those because we want to avoid the feelings of fear or of pain, just on a basic level, okay? And that works for a while. Does that make sense? You know, these coping strategies work. Otherwise we wouldn't use them. And I sometimes talk about other avoidance, you know, some of them, some of us use, um, Again, unconsciously repression or consciously suppression. Some of us use avoidance, you know, or we use blame or uh, defensiveness. You know, those are all totally adaptive coping strategies to avoid certain feelings or states that we don't, don't want to feel. And as I said, that works for a while, but there's something more in us that wants for wholeness. Does that make sense? You know, I. I like the saying, and I'll watch the time so I don't talk for too long. Um, I like the saying, it's not a saying, it's, it's a metaphor, you know, and I use it in my groups. That, um, the, 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 there's a, the metaphor, the, the story of a Buddha, a, a clay Buddha in, in, in Bhutan or one of these countries, and it was huge, huge clay Buddha. 
And they had to move it in the 1950s, and so they got a crane to move it. And they were surprised at how heavy it was. It was incredibly heavy. And after they moved it, they found there was a crack in the clay. And what they found was underneath the clay was pure gold. OK? What's the point of the story, you wonder? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, it's, it's uh, and the reason why it was is apparently is because whoever the monks were in Bhutan were trying to protect their gold from the invading uh, military or the invading sources uh, in Thailand. Does that make sense? You know, what do invading countries do? They loot, they pillage, they rape, right? So, um, so that was their, their mechanism of protecting the gold. So all of us human beings have gold within us. Okay? This, there's this gold. We're consciousness. We're, there's this beauty within us. I have seen over and over again when we human beings are relaxed enough and when our needs are being met, an inherent and natural goodness comes out within us, from within us. Can you relate to that, anyone here? Yeah. It's just, it's there. But what happens to us through life and through the various situations we go through, the difficulties we go through in school, bullying, family issues, beliefs that we take in in childhood, is we start to forget the gold and we identify with the clay. Does that make sense? So in, that, in some ways, we are lost to our true selves. We are separated, separated from our true selves and we start identifying with the clay. Now, one of the definitions of pain is the simultaneous longing for, yet separation from. Okay? So, when we do that, and we identify with the clay, we feel horrible inside. Does that make sense on some level? And then we unconsciously act out certain things that may have occurred to us in areas of our life that are going to call us to wake up, if you want, or to begin to see or recognize the clay and see the gold. But we all have the fear a terrible, understandable fear of either accessing that pain or accessing the fear until we learn the skills to be able to do so. Okay, so that's why we do denial from my, one of the reasons why we do denial from my perspective. That helps. Thank you. I see the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in, my, in my day job, I spend a lot of time with people with diabetes who don't take care of their disease. So you can imagine what happens at Mount Sinai when I'm seeing them is they'll send me someone and this person tells me they're taking care of their disease. And the bad thing about diabetes is you, you have the number. Like it says right there, you are you're definitely not taking care of your disease. And they said, well, yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm taking my insulin and I'm testing often. And, I don't know why that is. Maybe there's something wrong with your testing. And I've heard that. And I, and I don't say, no, no, our testing is the best. No, we have, instead I, I have to have them to stop and like say, okay, something's going on here. This person clearly knows at some level they're not doing this, but I, I need to begin to slow them down enough that this place becomes safe enough for them to tell me. And, and that's kind of where where we start. And I'm just, uh, you know, thinking of different people I've worked, worked with, but I'm going to pick a really easy one that's actually not about diabetes, but a patient who, who came to me and said he's not taking blood pressure medication. And he actually could say that. I don't know why I forget it every day. Now, in medicine, blood pressure medication, right, lowers your blood pressure, and we call it the low-hanging fruit. Why do we call it the low-hanging fruit? If you take it, you don't get a stroke, and it's easy. It's not like something hard. And he wasn't taking it. And he sent to me, and he says, like, I say, okay, so why aren't you taking this? I have no idea. So I do what all psychiatrists do initially. I give him a behavioral suggestion, which is, why don't you put it near your toothbrush? And he says, well, my endocrinologist told me that. And that sentence goes, you idiot. And I said, okay, okay, okay. So let me imagine, and this is what we'll do. Let me imagine, imagine every night for the next five years, you take your medication. I want you to close your eyes, and you can see I'm slowing it down. I want you to imagine opening that bottle and taking those pills every night for the next five years. And out of nowhere comes to his mouth, well, then I'd be an old man like my father. Okay, well, I had no idea that was coming. 
and he didn't either, right? His resistance at that moment was um, that he'll be an old man like his father. And if you probably noticed, I have a bit of a sense of humor. And I, and I thought to myself, oh, you'll never be that old if you don't take these. <laughs> but then he started taking it. And he was not conscious of that. So it's not a matter of like he was deceiving himself. He just didn't even know it. Like that's just outside of awareness. And he's 55, right? He's not like he's 25. He's like getting closer to an age where he'd need to take it. That's one, that's, so that's one deception, which is we have these underlying assumptions that guide our behavior. The next will be closer to what you're talking about in terms of harassment. So I used to do couples work. And uh, then I, I stopped because I wanted to feel better. <laughs> and, and when you're doing a lot of couples work, you see people say things you cannot believe, and then they say, I didn't say it. Or, I didn't say it meanly. That's my favorite one. <laughs> I didn't say it meanly. And I think it's important, I think when, as much as I'm saying with a sense of humor, when I'm there, I'm thinking, okay, he, well, it was usually he. But he means it or she means it, right? They really do mean it. They're not like saying, you know what? I'm just fooling you, right? Because they are, once again, you have to remember, they're feeling profoundly threatened in some fashion. They are feeling, not that it makes necessarily any sense to the outside, but this person's feeling threatened. And it doesn't give them permission to be mean-spirited. But my goal is to have them, you know, gain an insight into why they're being this way and what they believe about their partner, about themselves, about the situation that's having them use such an, you know, my line is usually if you're using a strategy like yelling at the other person, you've really run out of other ideas. And, and you really want to slow someone down and you will often find things like um, they're afraid that they're losing control or they're afraid that this this other person called their spouse is going to leave them, and they actually believe that if they can yell at them, they're going to settle down and stay. Mm -hmm. But if I yell at them enough, maybe it'll get through to them. And finally, often people feeling harassed in some way feel hurt, right? And are disappointed with the situation. And I think those are all things that come up. I think in the, the workplace ones, we have to add the dimension of a uh, huge threat. Like there's the threat is the key word. That person uh, is at risk of losing everything, and including their integrity of how they like to see themselves. Mm -hmm. And all of that's at stake, and they have to maintain it uh, by sticking with their story about themselves. And it's a story. We all have stories about ourselves. We, you know, we always are telling ourselves stories. So I would say that as well. There's a story, a primary story. We want to tell ourselves and the person that you're talking about doesn't want to accept the other story which might be that they feel very small or they feel like they no longer uh, have a role to play or they feel this other person's in some way threatening something they see about themselves um, i've got a question for that but first in the audience how many of you are hr practitioners okay. how many are working in the wellness Okay. Um, okay, that's very interesting. Um, so the question would be, is you, the last part about it's uh, probably the, their view of um, their integrity of how they see themselves. That really resonates from what I've seen. What would you recommend to um, the person, whether they're wellness or HR, could be a manager with an employee, if they first start to identify some of this, at this Heidi's point, to see where we can catch it, earlier on, what steps might that uh, person take to help the individual, um, maybe they don't directly acknowledge it, but help them to move through it? Because this is all about them being productive in the workplace yeah. and also not causing issues in the workplace. Um, well, one of the things that comes up for me is, you know, you have to address the fear and the threat. Right. And, and, and also, just on a systemic level, you have to look at, well, what is the work environment? And how supportive is the work environment? You know, 
I think apparently, um, you know, they, they, they've, they've done, they, they did studies around um, team building in, in I'm not sure which, one of the big companies, right? And, and what makes the best teams. And it didn't have anything to do with people's abilities or it had absolutely everything to do with psychological safety. So if we don't feel safe, we're not going to, we're not going to open up, right? We're not going to be honest. And so, um, you know, prior to when the issue actually arises, I mean, there's, you know, it's multidimensional, obviously, but I mean, if you're looking at it on, on an interpersonal level, having, having someone that they can feel that they can actually trust, and maybe they have to go outside of the environment first in order to be able to talk to somebody rather than within the environment. And then to start to look at that, you know, in, in some ways, there's, there's multiple, multiple interventions that one can do to help people, you know, create, you know, allow for some accountability. And it takes time and it takes skill, but to look at what the underlying, you know, what, what the mechanisms are in, in the defense mechanisms, right? What, how that's serving them and how it's not serving them and then looking at changing behavior there. Right? I think at work, at, certainly in the HR department, um, I think people are afraid, like you say, everything's at stake. They're, they're feeling threatened that once they acknowledge that they are struggling, everything's gonna fall apart. And so I think I've seen our organization in particular move over the last five years or so, um, but lots of organizations around us. Like it takes time to, for people to trust the system that, that we are putting in place, that they won't lose everything, and that it is safe to, it is safe to say you're struggling. <coughs> so that may, that may, like it resonates a lot what you're, what you're saying. So there's the other piece, which is uh, the probably the most stimulating bell. Talk day, so and it is kind of you know mental health is invisible. Mental health issues are invisible. So when I hear about someone uh, being aggressive or being uh, angry in the workplace, you know I've got to go through you know my mental health checklist, which is do they have ADHD? Do they have depression? Do they have an anxiety disorder? Do they have a substance abuse? Like before we even go to this is a psychiatrist talking, but before I even go to you know psychological models. I have to go through the psychiatric lens that people that do things and they seem out of control might have mental health issue that, that needs to actually be addressed. And that you're just seeing its manifestation in how they treat an employee, uh, someone, uh, a leader in the organization. And I think it, it speaks to then the, the one step back which is whether an organization is really open to finding out about mental health and mental illness. And if they're not open to it, no one's saying anything. No one's, nobody's gonna come forward to HR and say, because I've experienced working with patients where incredible stories I could tell you, like a person who works in accessibility in a college, in our city, and uh, he or she suffers from ADHD, and they tell me that her accommodations are unacceptable. She's working in accessibility in a college, and her accommodations I've written are unaccessible, are unacceptable. And, and that does not create a lot, back to fear, that does not welcome the next person to say, oh, by the way, I have a depression, I'm being treated for that, and sometimes I need to be off work. So I would step back from that story and say, you know, is that culture one where people, it's a, people are allowed to be unwell? And in an unwell in an invisible way. You know, you would never, uh, I mean, it's very serious. You would never turn to Stephen, Steve Hawkins, one of my, my you know, heroes, and say, like, what's with you, man? What are you doing over there? Like, really? I mean, that's seriously, but you would do that with depression. What do you mean you can't get to work? I don't see anything wrong. We wouldn't say that here. Dan. I know you wouldn't. Not here. Not here. I mean, other places across the street. <laughs> or people driving in the traffic in Toronto on the way here. I have to say. Uh, so that, I think that's important also in terms of, like, I think we have to stand back at what's the culture, what's the acceptance of mental health and mental illness before we jump on what's that symptom I'm watching. I just want to add to that part of what drove, I mean, the stories underneath the slogans. So there's Bell Let's Talk, there's all these lovely slogans. There, Cam H just published their leadership playbook. Deloitte published a study on, on workplace mental health and what we can do. Um, but they're all still just kind of words and floating out there and they're abstract ideas. 
and these large institutions that are pushing all this forward are still not talking about these underlying things. So uh, one example would be um, leadership training and and then in the, I read this yesterday, in the CAMH publication, and I'm not ripping on CAMH because they do lots of wonderful things, but it says, here's a bunch of studies that prove leadership changing, or leadership training and mental health um, improves short-term and long-term outcomes. And then you look at the references, you read the studies, and the studies say, these results are problematic, Even the, the authors of the study, these results are problematic because the there's no double blind, there's no you know, rigorous research. Um, the uh, people that were um, surveyed or whatnot are likely biased because they're part of this movement. And then CAMH will turn to the Canadian Mental Health Association and the Mental Health Association will be responsible for delivering the training. And then it goes, so I'm pointing in a direction of some higher level systemic issues where it's almost as if these larger organizations are circulating information between each other and patting each other on the back um, and still not addressing the issues uh, like similar to this um, and maybe that's my own biased opinion which it probably is in some respects no doubt um, but i still don't see you never even what you have um, barry and heidi have discussed you would never read any of that in any of these publications. Even just a sincere acknowledgement of those things. Maybe it's not the place to do it, but I still think those conversations aren't being honored and just how difficult it is. So another study was, you know, three out of four people would said they would be supportive of an employer or of an employee or a coworker who came to them. A smart building has a mind of its own. Um, Alexa, <laughs> are you here? Um, and then the, but then half of that amount of people would be willing to open up and ask for help. So I think to the psychological thing, there's a gap between we think we would be helpful to somebody if they came to us, but when they come to us, we're like, ah. This isn't my problem. I don't know how to handle this. See you later. And then that perpetuates the lack of willingness to open up. So that was a bit of a a lot to barf out on everybody. Um, but yeah, please. Well, I, I think it's also important to think about the number of people that have mental illness that are incredibly successful. Like, I, think we just, I think that they need to stand up and say it. I think, for example, um, so Richard Branson just started an organization to talk about disability. And here's a guy who you know, openly says, I have dyslexia. And his rule is about all advertising for his virgin companies are that if I can understand it, other people will. Which is incredibly humbling. Like, I, I, don't, I, you know, I think that's really amazing. And you know, they asked him, well, what did it teach you having dyslexia? He says, well, I knew I had to have good people around me to do the things I can't do. So I'm thinking that there's a guy that should be out there more. He's out there talking about this. You, mean, you wouldn't say uh, to Ted Turner, you know what, that bipolar disorder is going to stop you from starting CNN. Like, you know, there's just a lot of people out there with mental health, mental illness issues that if we can champion them, they can maybe make organizations say, hey, uh, these people have been incredibly successful because that's how we do respond to things. Uh, maybe we need to be more accepting of what are the strengths of the people besides this label, which is their mental health issue. And Celise and I, over the years, have often talked about we. So we met each other working in the design industry, and I've been at a couple of design firms. Some people in here from those. Um, some of the most creative people are also the people that are struggling with mental health issues. Um, some like some of the best people we've ever met, right? Can I just ask? A question? Please. Probably for Carrie. Uh -oh. um, do you have, are you aware of people voluntarily mentioning that they have an issue with their mental health or, you know, disclosing that? 
Is there a lot of fear for people to be disclosing that kind of information about themselves? It has nothing to do with their performance, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm just going to repeat the question. Uh, are you aware of people disclosing openly without being pushed or prodded? And you said something about the fear it, with that. Is there a fear? Is there a fear of... Why do I have to disclose? Why do I have to? Yeah, that's that a great question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so in the, in the time I've been practicing HR, it, it's like a major shift into people bringing, being very open about it. Here at Amazon, I think, yeah, lots of people, lots of people come forward. I think I'm really lucky, though, to have a really good leadership group that is, is okay with that and a really strong HR team that can handle that because that's the next step, right? Like I say, the compassion part is easy, but it's the managing performance part that you have to separate the illness, just like any other illness. But I think the fear is subsiding a little. But I think it takes time like, to prove that the systems are in place and that people do go off and they do come back and they do get promoted. And it's taken a while, but I, I think I'm probably having similar um, experiences in other organizations in HR as well. I have a super yes, quick question. Yeah. Um, I, my personal experience with HR in sort of the corporate world versus, um, sorry, it's okay. My personal experience with HR <coughs> in the personal world, I've had to take some time um, throughout my career, and the impression often is that the organization is so fearful of someone taking advantage of the system that the courage behind the actual asking for help isn't always recognized. And I know that there is a paradigm shift that is happening and it's beautiful. And I think that we need to hold more space for that. Um, and I work in substance use disorder treatment and um, with co-occurring disorders. And I think that you know, if someone says, I'm a high functioning addict working at this Bay Street law firm, I need help that person quite probably isn't looking for a 45-day paid rehab vacation. They are likely looking to get help. And yet the knee jerk tends to be, this person could be taking advantage of the system. We need to make sure this is you know X, Y, and Z. So I'm curious about how from a <coughs> HR uh, professional, you manage that. So Lise taught me how to do this. <laughs> oh, I'll start and then maybe we can add on. Um, first, a, a comment that Mike and I were talking about, and that is there's still a lot of stigma, obviously. Um, we were talking about, in my parents' generation, how if you had any mental health issues or your family did, it could cause termination of employment. It could cause the fact that you or your siblings uh, wouldn't be hired. So many families suppressed it, didn't talk about it. They tried to cope with it. And some of that stigma still continues on that nobody in our family has mental health. So we've got that going on as we're learning and understanding. Um, and thank God really for Canada for being uh, brave and courageous and moving in this area because as we move forward with, with artificial intelligence, the only place we're going as humanity is the intellectual relationships, which means more and more of our mental health issues are going to come out. But in terms of the um, dealing with it, I found in my experience when I was an HR practitioner is that the people who did come forward often came forward because they had some very good care from people like Heidi and Barry, and that part of their healing was to come forward. And we do have a huge gap. Um, Heidi and I were talking about that, and I said, there's no money, and she didn't hear the no, and she said, what, there's money? Where's the money? <laughs> so in the meantime, when we don't have, and there's a big, big gap, it's really about our um, case management. And so to Carrie's point with uh, staff is, how do you manage it well? That it starts, your company starts to get the reputation and the word will go around. It's very quiet. People will talk to one another. It takes time. You don't have to put big, you know, port, um, posters and everything. It's the stories that go around. Mm. But it's working with your providers. And 
lots of people will say, well, I've checked the box. I've got them to go and talk to. And then there's a huge gap. Huh. So I always say, be very bold. First, be bold in understanding what your duty is as an employer. Speak to your lawyers. And ask, what can you do to help? There's privacy legislation, but do not, do not let that get in your way. Find out what you can do with that. And then be, be very, very bold when you're speaking with the, um, the case management. Speak with not only the case worker, but speak with the manager. Have a very open discussion to say, I want the best for this employee. And I want to make sure that they can return to work. Um, share lots of information that you can so that you do everything possible to help that person. And through that, that story will get out in different ways and more and more people will come forward. But we are going to be inventing, we're going to be exploring, we're going to have to figure out as employers, where is that line between the healthcare, what can we or can we not talk about, and how do we together go forward? And I think that's our biggest opportunity and challenge as we go forward. Okay, yeah, and just in the, looking at the clock staring me in the face, um, I, so a lot of the other questions were answered, I think, or addressed in the conversation. Um, I want to get to this question and then we'll open it up, um, which was um, how to bring ourselves more self-compassion. And Heidi, you said you might be willing to do a little self-compassion exercise with us. And if you had comments about the other stuff that was said, please do that first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, um, I, I, I think, again, I'm not in, in the business of business or, you know, in, in workplace, but I think there's also just, again, on, a, on the human level, and maybe this is happening, uh, looking at, you know, systemically, what are the values that the organization is holding, and then what are the values of the individual, and if the values of the organization is say just about productivity um, or what you know again I don't know and it's not about um, uh, you know supporting supporting employees and and supporting the work in, in environment etc um, or there's some at odds with that you know because I think that ultimately when we get when I get back to that piece of this inherent goodness when we do feel safe and we feel nurtured and we feel we belong to something there is this desire within each of us to be creative and productive you know, and and it's there. So um, so that just for me is what comes up with respect to that. And and then that needs to be discussed within the organizations and have clarity around that. So that the threats are subdued, you know, or the fear of threat or the fear of something bad happening, you know, or, you know, are, are in some ways addressed. Um, does any did anyone else want to address that question? I know you want to get on. Uh, yeah, we're going to do the yeah. question break, okay. and then we're going to get into the more but, dialogue. Yeah, so, um, yeah, yeah, because the question was about, about um, you know, what is self-compassion and how do we develop it. I mean, self-compassion is trainable, and, um, and it's actually quite essential, because in order for us to become compassionate with others, others well, actually, that's not... Sorry, I go. Let, let, let me rewind. Um, we are actually what they found is eighty percent of the time we are much more compassionate with others than we are with ourselves. That's what they found in, in the studies that have been done, and um, uh, and so, but the the training of self compassion can be a very very valuable skill to have. And there's many, there's lots of benefits. There's lots of health benefits um, that I won't get into. But um, when, and one of the things that I want to mention to you um, before I guide you perhaps through this little exercise um, of a self-compassion exercise and then um, just a, a short exercise of uh, recognizing something we might appreciate and just to notice how, that, how you're impacted by that. Um, some context, Mike was talking about, we talk about all these things, but we don't actually do anything to help us practice. Does that make sense? So I thought we'd give you something experiential for today, if you're willing to play with this. And the other thing is just to mention about compassion. There's three, three major components to, to compassion or self-compassion. One is the awareness. We have to have the awareness that we're suffering. Okay? 
And that's very hard for us, because our tendency when we are in pain or suffering is to go into our mind and try to figure things out, or we go into denial or defense. Is that, we understand that? The other one is the recognition that I am not alone in this. So if I were to go around the room and say, who here has ever had a failure? You know, who here has ever, you know, been humiliated? Who here has ever, you know, not done the best at what they wanted? You'd probably, we'd all probably have a full room of hands up. Is that fair to say? So the reality of our humanity as human beings is that we have successes and we have failures. And we have pain. And we have, you know, wonderful joy. Okay, it's all part of being human. So that recognition that even though our pain is, is in many ways personal to us, right, when we're in it, we're not alone. Okay? And the third part is the kindness part, which is sometimes a difficult part that we human beings have towards ourselves. Okay? Which is, there's a whole reason for that. But the third part is just to practice bringing kindness towards ourselves. Okay? So, if you again, if you don't want to do this, you can go na 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 na, or you know, think about what you got to do tomorrow. Huh? Quietly to yourself. Yeah, quietly to yourself. Right. And and if you're willing to play with this, you know, um, we can give it a, a little shot. Okay. So what I want you, to, if you're willing, to close your eyes. I'll, I'll explain what we're going to do, and then you can decide what you want to do. And if half the room leaves, I'm in big trouble. Okay. But the, the idea is just to think about a situation that has caused you a little bit of distress. We're not talking about, you know, say a 10 out of 10 is the most distressing, you know. It could be that your neighbor's dog continuously barks, you know, and you're fed up with it or, you know, something that's caused you a little bit of distress. So five, six out of 10, you know, or maybe you're just upset that you haven't quite, you know, got that deadline done or maybe you're... Everybody, just show of hands. Have you got a little situation that's causing you some distress? Okay. And if not, you can do your na 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 na. So let's just, if we're willing, just to close our eyes and just think about that situation that maybe is causing you a little bit of anxiety or a little bit of a little bit of discomfort or a little bit of you know kind of constriction, a little bit of tightness. And just, just recognize this. Let, let's not go into our mind and figure it out. Let's just recognize this is a moment of distress. This is a moment of, of hurt or pain or fear. And this is hard. This is difficult. So we're just naming what is. This is difficult. And then next, if you're willing to, just acknowledge that everyone else in the room is experiencing or thinking of something that's causing them a little bit of distress or fear or pain. So I am not alone in this. I'm not, everyone here is, is touching on a moment that's causing them some discomfort. And now, if you're willing, within the privacy of your own experience, within the privacy, if you've got your eyes closed and everybody has their eyes closed, within the privacy of your own experience, okay? Just think of, just, just, just try to imagine what words of kindness would you like to hear right now? If you were talking to a friend who was going through this, what would you say? Yeah, this is tough. I get it. It's not easy. No? Everybody, we all go through this. I get it. I wish I could take away the distress or the pain if I had a magic wand. Or maybe just imagine breathing out that difficulty or that challenge just with each exhale letting it go. And now, just, just, just sort of, you know, letting it go. And now, if you're willing, just think about something that for today gave you a smile, allowed you to smile. So it could have been the beautiful sun outside, you know, or the view if you came up here and you saw Lake Ontario and the shimmering of the sun on there, or maybe some other moment where you, you just, a connection or with someone or a great tasting piece of fruit that you might have had, something that allowed you to feel good. 
And just allowing yourself to continue to imagine that kind of good feeling or that feeling of appreciation. And again, it's optional, but we have this sense of touch. And if it feels okay, you can put your hand on your sternum. And, and only if it feels right for you, you don't have to do it. Touch is an incredible modality of sense. Our mammalian brain responds to it automatically. And just take in that good feeling. Just let yourself take in that good feeling, just because. If you could breathe it in and savor. And then when you're ready, you can um, take your hand away from your strain if it was there and open your eyes and come back to the room. And then just, um, again, if you were doing na 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 na, you can notice that. And then if you were actually felt yourself engaged, just notice how you're feeling in this present moment. Just take the time. Hold mine for me. Thanks. So hard to talk after that. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> excuse me. As was said, we could stand here for a week and talk about this, which I would be more than willing to do. If anyone wants to hang around, uh, but now it's if anybody has particular questions, we'll also let people leave if anyone has to go. Now is probably a good time to go. Uh, I know Barry's got to go in about seven minutes. So if anyone, maybe, if anyone has a specific question uh, towards Barry, they should ask that. Otherwise, anybody have a question? Okay, and I'm going to pass the mic over, okay? I'm going to try to formulate the question. Yeah, please end it in a question mark. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts around functional, functional positions that people assume in an organization, if there is a difference in terms of the challenges you face uh, for navigating, you know, the best type of an approach for any, you know, safeguarding mental wellness. So I'm, I'm mindful of environments like manufacturing uh, versus corporate office or mobile um, positions. Um, never mind the different layers of rankings of positions where you one position has more authority than another, that kind of thing. I'd like to take advantage of Barry's time before you go because I'm, I'm just wondering in terms of the work you do in coaching in people in different responsibilities and what how you've helped them or what you would suggest in terms of the suitability, the functionality, the question you asked. So give me a little more detail. So more. you were asking about uh, the roles that people have in uh, an organization and their responsibilities. Right. And it's, it's the question about the suitability to their role and how... Are there and, any variations of challenges that you feel leaders experience depending on the type of sector or the type of teams that they have to lead? Like a 24-7 type of an operation and what kinds of challenges? Okay. There's okay. I understand it. Um, give, maybe we can still take advantage of you. But um, one one thing that the uh, Canadian Mental Health has found out is that managers yeah. are the uh, most under duress and most likely to experience mental health because they're sandwiched in between um, the needing to get um, information out. They're often rising up. They don't have the experience yet. They don't have all the answers. So. The difficulty is how do you reach out and help the manager in terms of mental health. So then I sort of throw to say, have you found anybody that you've been working with, whether it's a manager or somebody else, and that their position in the company is, is contributed to or triggered or whatever? So, so in terms of um, managers, I, I agree. That seems, that seems to be a particularly challenging role to play. Uh, I would say... My first, um, what I find with managers, there's like, there's a number of steps that I, I need generally to do. One is to help them manage their level of stress, like have them actually recognize it and understand 
the difficulties they're having of two groups of people with, very, with completely different demands. That's one thing. The second thing is I always want managers, I think it's one of the really unfortunate titles calling you a manager. I always say to managers, you actually are leaders. You just have to be leaders that are in the middle, but you are leading. And I think that that is actually something that empowers them a great deal, because then I take it very seriously and I say to them, okay, I want to figure out what your purpose is, as a manager. And I don't do that because I like to talk about purpose, but I do. Um, it's because if you have people stuck in a place of, of a great deal of stress and a great deal of, and looking at their stressors, it actually, and I go back to neuroscience, it cuts off their higher functioning brain. So I want to have them actually define what, how, like what's their actual sense of why are you doing this? And that they actually reactivate a sense of it that comes from a place of, who they are, what they're hoping to be, and where they're hoping to go in life, and why, what they're offering their team, and that seems to take them out of that stress state. They slip back into it, don't, don't get me wrong, but it's that sudden opportunity to give them two levels of functioning from, that's one thing. And the other is, managers just, a lot of the work I end up doing with them is around interpersonal skills. And, and it seems like, you know, I, I, it's a lot about saying, Let's role play, which I like doing, and it's it's fun to do. And that helps them realize, you know, a lot of skills they didn't need at the level right below. And you're starting to then develop the skills that are on the way to being a leader, actually. And But I do stick by the idea that managers really need to be called leaders in the middle, as opposed to uh, managers. <laughs> and sorry, do you want to add to that? No. Uh, do you need to go, Barry? Do you want to go? Okay, great. Awesome. Get to another talk. Okay, <laughs> I know, yeah. Here. Hey, I, I think I'd just add one thing. So I do a lot of work with um, mental health within sales. And what I've noticed is um, salespeople face various trigger events, whether it's missing target, micromanagement, rejection. And depending on the, the type of role, whether it's like an SDR or BDR, they will face things like missing target is really impactful to them or micromanagement by leadership. But when you start looking at sales leaders specifically, they, it, the, the thing that impacts their mental health the most is gonna be working with the demotivated sales team. Or if you have an account manager who's primarily focused on growing accounts, if you ask that person to make a cold call, it's outside of their realm of expertise or, or what they're confident in, that's gonna impact them the most. Um, so what's really interesting in terms of the work that I'm doing is the role really depends, or, or the role that they're in really, it, the trigger events are going to be different and people are resilient to specific things and part of the leader needs to be able to manage and understand um, where they're struggling the most and what trigger events can apply most to that, to that position. So I just thought I'd add that. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. I have a funny story um, about one of my clients, this is a principal of a very large elementary school. There were problems within school which we resolved, but there still remain problems with the parents in the greater community. And this principal was long-standing, 35 years, brilliant on the pedagogy side of it, very quiet. And so I was working with her to say, well, what is it that you can do so that you can just sort of walk around and, and assert your authority? I said, maybe you could um, get yourself ready so as soon as you leave your office every time you, you walk out, you know, with your shoulders back and people see that you are the leader of this school. So about three weeks later, um, I was touching base with her and she said, you know, it worked. And I said, great, well, what did you do? Well, I put my headset on and every time just before I was to leave, I cranked up the volume and listened to the theme song of Rocky Balboa. <laughs> <laughs> Motivated by music, you could say. Uh, question, yeah. Uh, so. Oh, sorry. I, uh, yeah. I'll take one. Can we? Bye. 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 So, uh, so currently we experience a lot of people who are working remotely who are not in the same uh, area so we understand that the more you meet with a person it's easier to figure out 
there's probably not something right. But it's extremely difficult in virtual teams and and also in teams, there's certain situations like maybe somebody's a project manager or always on site, there's somebody in sales who's always out there. They still have at least one touch point. But the people who work virtually and remotely, that's one of the biggest challenge. So what do you suggest that companies do, small and big, that address this? Or how do we open up the platform for people that they feel that okay, this is it's okay if I come back and tell them. Yeah, um, and I've encountered that um, often with clients. Um, I coin it belongingness. Is that because they're working virtually, they're, they've lost that sense of belongingness, which is really really important to their sense of purpose and who they are and how they relate. And so there's two parts of it. One is um, that the organization look at those points of contact in the meetings they have. Often those meetings do not go well because they're not structured well and the voices aren't heard. So the uh, leader in the middle would be checking off the box that they've done the call but they haven't really had the voices heard. So you could look at that. And the other thing is that organizations have to invest in the time and money to bring people together physically. And they need to do it at least twice a year, if not more. It's the cost of doing business, and there's just no way around it. Human beings do need to touch base with one another. The productivity that you get is absolutely huge when you do that. Um, so I'll, I'll throw to Carrie. The question was, as you just come in, in this world of virtual work and people not feeling a part of it, what are the sorts of things that organizations can do to make people feel a better part of it? I just said it's belongingness and there's some things, but what have you found? I didn't hear what you said. You said belonging? Yeah, so in terms of belongingness to, uh, <laughs> thanks for my help here, um, is that they, two things. One is they make sure that meetings do run really well, that people do have a voice. But the second thing is that it's a cost of business to bring people together at least twice a year. Yeah, I would say that too. So Amazon's really virtual and us being in Toronto, I don't know how many Amazonians are in here. Um, Oh, there's one. Sarah's <laughs> <laughs> here. I met my team. Um, it's hard, but you, FaceTime still matters. So getting out to the getting out to the mothership in Seattle often enough. Um, uh, vid uh, cam video camera, video phone. We our chime the chime is our AWS product. That being on camera, we actually make sure that everybody is on camera, whether you want to be or not. And that takes some getting used to, but it really does make a difference. Um, what else? I think we've worked really hard here from an organizational perspective too to have a, Amazon's a very distinct culture, but what we've tried to do is make sure that we have a Amazonian culture that is, um, Amazonian, <laughs> it's a real word, um, that is very uniquely Toronto, very uniquely Canadian. And I think as a, as a site, we've kind of banded together and we have some belonging just be, by virtue of being um, in a site um, all with one, one Amazon abundance. <laughs> I would just add, oh, um, <clears throat> Jeff and I have worked with, or were trying to create an agreement with a company. It was going to be all the national leaders in one place and a live training. And then they just started backpedaling about, oh, can we do it virtually? Oh, it's too much difficult to get everyone together. And we just said, you know, we can't. That's not our cup of tea, but that's a good example of the resistance to, to and they're a huge, multinational organization that certainly has the money to do it. Um, but it is complicated too. I mean, I don't know how, how easy it is to organize a meeting for anybody, but you know, just getting three people in a room together at the same time nowadays is like ridiculous. So there, there is that complication on top of it, but I certainly agree companies, I mean, we know being in contact with each other is so much nicer. So it's kind of the balance with that. I find but, yeah. that once you do that, though, keeping up the virtual relationship is bet is easier. Once you, <clears throat> once you, it's it's actually impossible to get everybody together when some people are in India and some people are in Seattle or whatever. Question? Yeah. Yeah. And then I think we got maybe three. This is number one. Hello. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to ask, at the individual level, let's say you're interested in promoting mental health um, awareness or just mental health in general on a team or 
on a larger scale, what would you do? Like, how, how do you find the resources to know what you can do to do that? On the individual level, what can you do? Like, this is your organization you're speaking about. Sorry? I'm hiding back here. <laughs> no, but I mean, on the individual level, how can you do that as far as, are you, I'm not sure I understand the question. Let's say you're interested in promoting mental health. Yes. Or right. mental health. Yeah. So you're yeah. not a manager, you're not in HR, what can you do? Yourself. Yes. Well, I think if you yourself are interested in promoting mental health, then it, it would, for yourself, mental well-being and mental health, it might be joining uh, like a meditation group or it might be, um, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, places even in Toronto where they have um, uh, groups that, that teach about self-awareness and emotional awareness and, and meditation that are all part of, of developing a healthy state of being and mind, yeah. So if you're asking about specific resources, you can talk to me after the, after the, after the workshops, yeah. I would also say don't underestimate the, the impact you can have by noticing somebody struggling and just being a safe place to, to talk. I think we definitely have a pretty secret network in, in Amazon of people that know that there are other people that are struggling and, and they know that they need to check in on those people. Um, the same thing in my life, um, and, and so don't underestimate that just doing that is, has a huge, and those are the stories that also kind of permeate. Um, they take a while to make a big impact, but they, but they sort of the trickle down effect, right? And I can just answer that in terms of the, the national standard for psych safety, in this recent Deloitte study pointed to lack of resources or nobody, if it's within an organization, which I think was part of your question, right? So. There's this assumption that you need a bunch of money and you need leadership involved, which really isn't necessarily true at all. So I think getting a somewhat of a clear idea of what it is that you want to do first and to be able to articulate that clearly to your coworker or senior, senior person and then slowly building it up from there. But you definitely don't need, I think we seem to think there's something out there but it's like in here, and in the purpose and the de desire to make something happen. Okay, and sorry, there was, yeah, thanks. We don't have much more time. Um, I find that workplace investigations are very disruptive to the workplace and the work environment. And um, I'm wondering if you could share some examples of interventions to restore the workplace after an investigation. Okay. So the first, first thing is their necessity. Um, so sometimes we don't want to do them because it could create a disruption. The second thing is whether you're doing it internally, and some of you here may be doing it, or whether you use an external, is that you try to keep the investigation uh, small. So you don't unnecessarily interview people that you don't need to. But when it is large, um, and it could involve everybody in a work site because it is that uh, wide, um, then you need to make sure you interview everybody. You cannot leave some out and leave some in because now people are more knowledgeable and you've got that, those that are you know, the haves and the have-nots. The best way of restoration, um, and then, you know, there's, pick up on hiding the layers and the complexity. Certainly there's solutions and if there's unions involved, it's very good to have representation. But aside from what other restoration pieces there are, is to feedback the findings. So that which you can feedback to say, here's what we found. Here's what you said in terms of what your concerns are. And here's what we're going to do about it. And that there is follow-up afterward on what we're going to do about it. So everybody is on the same page. And they know they're not alone. And that the employer is doing something about it. And sometimes it takes a while. Um, I did one investigation, it was um, a 15-year problem. Um, it had resulted in two unions, steel workers and Teamsters, refusing to go to the location. Um, human rights complaints, uh, all sorts of problems. And I had to involve head office and you name it. But we did that and we made sure everybody heard about it afterward and that they were all engaged and that there was an HR person I coached all the way through to keep things alive. And the result afterward is they had the top employee engagement scores for three years running after that. But it was quite an undertaking. The employer was prepared to do it. Um, sometimes it's how much pain you're in 
and there's more of a willingness when there's more pain. Hi, it's Pat. My, my name's Bill. I just want to make a, a quick comment. So I'm just I'm a retired executive. I've worked downtown in this area for about 40 years, or at least in a couple of different jobs. Um, and the question earlier was, what, what are willing, people willing to come forward and talk about uh, the mental health issues? And I, so I would say I suffered from depression, fairly severe depression from, from recurrent, so I'd be fine for a while, then I'd go down and I used alcohol as my medication. Um, and I wouldn't talk, I didn't talk for years and years. I didn't talk to anybody, I didn't want to see, talk to a doctor, I didn't want to talk to people at work. But I just have one little example, I feel it's a long, been a long road for me, but um, I eventually just mentioned it to another executive, very senior executive in one of the financial institutions downtown, was a good friend of mine, and I mentioned to him, I remember driving, we were driving in a cab, and he said, you know what, I am mortified in going to, into meetings and dinners with people. Like I, it really, it really, it really, really, like I really get totally nervous and I do it. And this is, a, a, so it's not a, um, it's not an uncommon thing. I mean, people, and I would say that, any, uh, you know, the, my advice to anybody, I think most of us have, have some issue is to talk, is to talk to people. And it may not be talking to a professional, it may not be talking to HR at first, but, uh, you know, talk to a friend, talk to, talk to people. Thanks. Okay, last one. Yeah, sure. Okay, last one. It's actually adding to that because, you know, when I was at my lowest uh, point with depression, something that I didn't want to do it was to actually talk. I didn't want to talk to anybody. So my question for HR is, like, what's going to happen? Like, how do you provide the resources or how do you help those people that you know that they have a problem, but they are in denial? Like, they don't want to say anything, but it's for sure that they need the help. So this, this is typical. It's, um, it's, a, it's a common problem, and I think that's where you do need HR's help as an impartial party. Um, it's a really tough conversation. Um, normally, people who don't want help will finally, or sort of refusing help, will finally listen when they realize it's affecting their performance. Um, and so then the question is, it's not very invasive. It's very much, we can see that you're like, is, is there anything going on? Um, what do you need from us to get you back to your, good, your best self? Um, and then usually we'll be, as soon as you make that shift from it's, it's really affecting your, your, your deliverables, then people will, will say something. And if they don't, and you can see that they're struggling, then comes the even more difficult conversation of saying, if you can't, if you're telling me you have everything you need and we can still see you're struggling, we're going to be actually measuring you as though you're well. And that's not necessarily going to bring about the best results. And usually that'll get people. It's, a, it, it's often a numerous conversations to get people there, though. But most firms are going to have the ability to call someone privately without going to an HR. Yeah. Um, and I think we addressed a lot of the, I'd like to answer that too, some of the things we talked about before about sort of baby steps towards getting somebody towards a place where they might be willing to open up because of the fear and the, I mean, as many of us know, that can be a really dark place. And so that's complicated, obviously, but you know, the baby steps. And I think that's sort of what that's gets us there. Please. Sometimes it's getting to know the employee and figuring out who the best person is to have that conversation. Sometimes I'm not the right HR person and Kirsten is or Lisa is, or maybe sometimes it's just equipping the manager to go have the conversation. But as long as you're saying the right things, um, you sometimes have to pick the best person. And that, but that goes back to the earlier comments about making sure that the person's in a safe spot um, to admit it and, and still know they're gonna be okay. Most people need to know you'll have their back when they, when they head out to get better, that you'll, like, it's gonna be okay, you'll come back and, and I'll, we'll, we'll see you when you get here, sort of thing. Yeah, so I, I don't know about everybody, but it does not kind of feel good to be hearing these conversations, yeah? Like, it's so nice, I mean, this, if I could be sitting, like, this is what I would do all day, every day, <laughs> like, and, and I, in a lot of ways I get to, um, which is beautiful, and so, we have a sincere, there's some of my colleagues and people that I've worked with and continue to hear um, and our sincere desires to continue doing this kind of thing. I just want to point them out and just show my appreciation to them. And in the back, there's Ellen and Christine. 
Can you say hi, please? Yay. And over here, Jeff and Dave. And you guys go hi. And my beautiful brother and my good friend Jesse are over here too. And Tim. And hi, Tim. Can you say hi? Um, and last but not least, well, maybe not last, but in our, uh, a lot of work uh, that we've done in the schools was really helped along. I've been waiting for the getting choked up to come, um, has, was really helped along by a really special teacher. And that teacher believed in what I was trying to do, and she was so cool, and she just was amazing. And so we named an, uh, an award, you could say, or a token of recognition after the teacher. And we've given it out to three teachers now. Um, and this year, next year will be the fourth, or 2020. So I just... <laughs> I'm gonna get there. It's a beautiful, uh, I think it's Chad Cornfield who has the saying, the unbearable nature of beauty. Like, it hurts so much because it's so beautiful. <laughs> unbearable. Okay, I'm getting there. So, this is our first ever workplace acknowledgement. Woo! <laughs> 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 yeah. And so, uh, we're naming it after Carrie. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> oh, okay, and it's called... Okay, the Carrie Topping Award for Leadership in Humility and Service in Workplace Mental Health. So, wow. and, it, and it doubles as a desk weight, too. So, you can, like, you can pop out the medal and stick it in, it's super cool. And you can take off the badge. And, so, can we give her another round of applause? profile than the bell let's talk <laughs> uh, it's been awesome we met just about a year ago and I it's been awesome working with you for you we'll have to make this a, at least an annual thing and um, I'm excited to help you with your uh, with your um, state of mind festival as well so yeah so part so to all the people that donated money through the tickets thank you so much that was very kind part of really what this is is to allow us to do the work we do in schools for free so Bravo. our business model is a corporate one, but all or as much of the profits go to supporting the work we do in schools. So we have this event in May called the State of Mind Festival. It's been an amazing experience. And last year, yeah, Amazon was very supportive. And so again, we can't do anything alone. We need partners and we need help and et cetera. So that's part of what this is. Um, yeah, it's wonderful to see the kids come together and to have honest conversations that aren't like about getting more likes on their freaking Instagram posts. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really lovely. And I would say in the workplace too, but in our culture, if you will, I think a big pathway forward is to allow ourselves and each other to be more honest and to let down that guard and that fear and to Barry talked about it a lot of like soothing the I don't know downstairs brain uh, so that our higher functioning brain can work <coughs> excuse me more clearly um, and we all have a responsibility in that I, like it doesn't matter who you are and where you come from I can't speak to the unique pains and sorrows and etc that people face and I've had my own baggage of shit, uh, which is not as bad as somebody else's. And that's, you know, I also have my privileges and et cetera. So I don't think it's about that. It's about our willingness to acknowledge our own and each other's and to, and to go from there. So can we, I just want to thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Celise. And thank you everybody for coming. I think we're here to chat for a bit. Yeah. I know, Heidi, you have to go run a group. Yeah, I have to yeah. go run a group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>